Uh, and my title here is again, uh, Sex Differences in Brain Circuitry Underlying Addiction and Depression. But um, I, what I'd really like to do is tell you about some of the most exciting things going on in my research program right now. Uh, and, and one of those things uh, is the study of sex differences. And my research program does indeed study both depression and addiction. And I'm gonna tell you uh, kind of a, an abbreviated version of a story about sex differences in depression and how we study that. Uh, then I'll tell you a very sh little glimpse uh, of some really interesting stuff we're doing uh, technology-wise uh, in our studies of addiction. Uh, and then I'll kind of maybe give you in a single slide a brief overview of all the other cool things going on in, in my research program right now. Um, my program has kind of become a little bit like an octopus. We have lots of arms uh, in lots of different areas. And I don't have time to tell you about all of them today, but I'll give you a, 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 some little snippets of, of some of the, the biggest, most developed parts, and then I'll try to give you an overview of everything else. So to start with, let's talk a little bit about uh, depression and, and the sex differences uh, in depression. So uh, uh, this is a little bit of a text heavy slide, but most of them aren't like this. Uh, so I'm sure most of you are aware of what depression is. This is a, a disease uh, that's made up of a, of a bunch of different symptoms. Uh, and some of these include things that you'd imagine when you think of depression, feelings of sadness or uh, anxiousness or, or uh, empty mood. Um, the, there are also things like hopelessness, social withdrawal, and of course, suicidality, one of the leading causes of death. Uh, in the United States. So depression is a really big problem. Uh, and one of the number one uh, symptoms of depression, and the one that we're going to focus on the most in, in my talk today, is, is called anhedonia, which is a lack of feeling pleasure. So things that used to feel good to you, that used to make you feel happy, maybe interacting with family, doing your job, eating good food, listening to good music, um, these things don't give the same pleasure that they used to give, and that's called anhedonia. And the brain circuitry I'm going to tell you about today um, seems to be related to these feelings of anhedonia, uh, and we can model this in mice, and that's really what I'm going to tell you about. But the key uh, thing to understand uh, um, about depression as it relates to the study I'm going to talk about today is that there's an enormous sex difference uh, in humans uh, in depression uh, uh, patients. So women experience depression uh, at, at roughly twice the rate of men. So uh, basically twice as many women are diagnosed with depression as, as are men. Uh, and this is true in every culture across the world. Uh, about one in every eight women uh, can expect to develop depression during their life. And there are lots of factors that might contribute to this. Perhaps you're thinking um, that some of these factors are cultural, uh, like women might be more likely to talk to a doctor about their depressive issues, or um, the diagnosis might be uh, um, tilted toward, uh, toward things that women are more likely to discuss. Um, but because this is true across all cultures, and because there are a lot of other factors that have been directly um, uh, connected to depression, developmental, reproductive factors, hormonal factors, um, things like childbirth, menstruation, menopause, all of these things tell us that there are very likely to be physical differences between men and women that result in differences in the incidence of depression between the sexes. And what my lab is trying to understand is what are the differences in the brain between men and women that may underlie these differences in diagnosis of depression. And there are lots of labs out there that, that study this, and they study it in humans and in model organisms. My lab studies this question in mice, and most of what I show you today is going to be from our mouse studies. Now, I also mentioned that I want to talk a little bit uh, near the end of the talk today about addiction, and I want to introduce that uh, as, as a, a disease that's comorbid with depression, meaning people who have a, a depression are more than twice as likely to have addiction-related uh, uh, issues uh, as are people who don't suffer depression. Moreover, people with substance abuse problems are three to four times more likely to experience a de de depression during their lives. And so there's a connection between these two diseases. Now, there, there may be simply a causal link between the behaviors, and that might be what occurs to you uh, if you're feeling depressed, perhaps cocaine or alcohol are ways that a person might try to relieve those feelings of depression. Conversely, if you are addicted to substances, um, the, the problems that occur in your life as a result of those addictions, loss of job, um, family disintegration, uh, physical problems that can result from, from substance abuse, abuse and, and addiction, those might cause you to feel depressed. So then maybe there is a behavioral link between these two things. The two diseases can, could cause each other. But there are some arguments against that. 
for instance, um, we can use antidepressants, uh, and in many patients, these can relieve feelings of depression, but they don't prevent the continued abuse of substances. They don't treat addiction. Or on the flip side, um, if, if you're uh, a person who has uh, substance abuse issues, when you're intoxicated, when you're using the substance, you can still have depressive episodes. So these things suggest that it's not simply that the two behaviors feed forward into each other. Rather, what we, what we find is that there are physical risk factors for both of these diseases that are common. So for instance, there are genetic predispositions for both depression and addiction. Uh, there are social and environmental factors like um, having experienced trauma uh, or high levels of stress or being from a, a socioeconomically disadvantaged background. These things can uh, all lead to both depression and addiction. And the one thing to keep in mind is that depression involves feelings and addiction involves behaviors, seeking and taking drugs. Well, any feeling that you have comes from your brain and any action that you perform, any behavior that you perform is also driven by your brain. So if, if there are differences that are, come from environmental interactions or genetics that are driving differences in the behaviors of substance abuse or the feelings of depression, they must be happening through the brain. So our thought, and this is not just my thought, but the thought of many researchers across the world who study these issues, is that perhaps there's a common physical cause in the brain that underlies both addiction and depression and that causes this comorbidity. So one of the, the things we really try to study in my group and in some of the other groups here at MSU and across the world are what are the shared physical changes that occur in the brain that might be driving these diseases. So I'm gonna tell you some stories about those things today. So the part of the brain we're gonna focus on today is the hippocampus. And you can see it uh, outlined here in red uh, in the human brain. And many of you have maybe heard of the hippocampus before. Most of the time you hear about this in terms of learning and memory. Uh, this part of the brain is really important for learning new facts and remembering things. And this part of the brain also is part that, that is uh, very often the first to be, uh, to be dysfunctional uh, in dementia and diseases like Alzheimer's. But it also plays a role in psychiatric disease. So changes in the hippocampus have been associated with schizophrenia, autism, and other diseases, and also with addiction and depression. So changes in the human hippocampus are associated with both of these diseases. Now the hippocampus isn't uniform, it's got some different parts. So here in the human brain, uh, you can see this area that we call the, ventral hip uh, the dorsal hippocampus and this area that we call the ventral hippocampus. And here's an illustration of a mouse's brain that also contains a dorsal hippocampus and a ventral hippocampus. Now this dorsal part up here, this is the part that, that is really important for that learning of facts and remembering facts, this cognition. This is the part that's dysfunctional in dementia and Alzheimer's disease. Down here, the ventral hippocampus, this part of the hippocampus seems to be important for emotional learning and for integrating memories with emotions. And it's dysfunction here that seems to be associated with addiction and depression that we're gonna talk about today. And the special thing about the ventral hippocampus is that it connects to many other regions of the brain. So these are some images from my lab. And I'm, I'm sure all of you are aware that the brain is filled with cells. These cells, many of them are called neurons, and there's about 90 billion neurons in, in the average adult human brain. And each of those neurons can have around 10,000 connections to other neurons. As you can imagine, this is enormously complex. So here you can see a picture of the hippocampus from my lab where we've made a bunch of hippocampal neurons glow green, and you can see all these little processes they send out. These are for connecting to other neurons we can do 3D reconstruction of these individual neurons and look at just one of these processes here. And you can see all these little bumps and lumps all along the process. Each of those are called dendritic spines. These little spines are the actual physical places where this neuron connects to other neurons. And what you can see is that every one of these processes is just covered in them. So the complexity of these connections is incredible. However, the different parts of the brain actually have organized connections to other parts, meaning many of the, the, these connections occur in an organized fashion between one brain region and another. And you can see that this itself is also complicated in this illustration over here. There's many different connections illustrated, and there's many more than are even contained in this particular illustration. 
But in today's talk, we're going to focus on just a single connection. And that's the connection between this hippocampus we've been talking about and a part of the brain that's important for feelings and emotion. A part of the brain that's been associated with addiction and depression as well. This is called the nucleus accumbens. And there are some really strong connections between this ventral hippocampus and the nucleus accumbens. And we're going to focus on this specific circuit today. So prior to my work on this circuit, other labs have shown in mouse models that this circuit is more active in mice that had depressive-like behaviors. Uh, and I'll show you some of the behaviors I'm talking about that we can use to model depressive uh, symptoms in mice. Other labs also showed that increasing the activity of this circuit could make mice have more of these depressive-like responses. But all of these studies were done in male mice. So in male mice, they showed that the increased activity of this circuit is associated with some of these behaviors that we were talking about that kind of make up the depressive phenotype. But that none of these studies included female mice. And as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we know that females are more than twice as likely to have depressive, uh, a diagnosis of depression than males. So our question was, what about this circuit in females? So this story I'm going to tell you today is about the differences in the circuit between males and females and how that might be connected to depressive, depression. So to, to do this, we, to, to, to study depression in animals, um, well, of course, you know that there's no such thing as a depressed mouse. Or if there is, we can't diagnose it. Because the way we diagnose depression in humans is by talking to them and asking them how they feel and observing their behaviors. But we can observe behaviors in mice. And we can observe certain behaviors that are analogous to the behaviors in humans that make us diagnose depression. Uh, and one of those behaviors that I mentioned at the very beginning was anhedonia, this lack of feeling pleasure. And this is a thing we can model in mice. And there's a specific stress paradigm that we use in my lab and that many other labs have used. We didn't invent this paradigm, but we use it, uh, that can induce this kind of anhedonia in female mice, but not in males, and can allow us to kind of model this propensity for anhedonic depressive-like behaviors in female patients compared to male patients. And so uh, in this particular uh, assay that I'm going to talk about a lot today, it's called the sucrose preference test. And in this test, a mouse is given two bottles. One bottle has water and one bottle has a sweet su sucrose solution, a sugar solution. And most normal mice will drink much more of the sugar solution than they will of the water. They prefer that because it tastes better. But mice that have anhedonia, that have a depressive-like phenotype, they have a reduction in this preference for sucrose. It doesn't matter to them as much anymore. They don't get the same level of pleasure from the sucrose that they get from the water. And what you can see graphed here is animals that are uh, controls here and here, or underwent this stress model of depression here and here. And what you can see is that in the females, but not in the males, there's a reduction in sucrose preference after we uh, uh, apply this paradigm. This models the anhedonia in, uh, in depression in humans. And that's what we're gonna really focus on, the involvement of this circuit, this brain circuit, in this behavior. Okay, so how do we study this circuit in the mouse? We have some really cool genetic tools that allow us to go into the mouse's brain and make all the cells that project, all these neurons that project from that ventral hippocampus to that nucleus accumbens, just that one circuit, we can make them light up green. Okay, we can make them glow. Uh, and so when we then use a microscope to look inside the mouse's brain, we can see these glowing green cells. And here's a more close up uh, version of them. You can see the cells glowing green here. And we can then perform a variety of techniques on these cells. And I'm gonna tell you about just really one of those techniques today. And that's a technique called uh, whole cell slice electrophysiology. But don't worry about those words. What I'm basically saying is that we can look at these cells under a microscope, identify them because they glow green, and then use really cool um, physical and computer technology to actually watch the cell's activity. Neurons fire. They have electrical impulses. And we can uh, observe these and control them using this technique in individual cells. So using this exact technique, we were able to look at the activity of the cells in that hippocampus that project to the nucleus accumbens, so this specific brain circuit, in female and male mice. Not the ones that we've stressed, just regular female and male mice. And what we found was something we really didn't expect. 
what we found was uh, that the activity of these neurons, as shown by these spikes here, these action potentials, these are the neurons firing. The activity of these individual neurons was higher in females than in males. You can see more action potentials here in the female than you can in the male down here. This circuit is more active in the female mice than in the male mice. And you can see that graphed over here. I'm gonna show you more of these graphs later. The males are in purple. Look, there's more spikes. The females are in green, there's fewer. So across lots of animals and lots of cells, we repeatedly find that this circuit is more excitable in the females than the males. And if you'll remember, what I told you at the very beginning was that many other labs have shown that increased activity in this circuit drives these depressive-like behaviors in the mice. So if the females already have a more active circuit, maybe that could explain why they have a higher propensity for depression. But the question is, why is their circuit more active? What's driving this activity? So there could be lots of things behind this. Uh, this could be developmental or genetic, but um, what we tried to focus on was the hormonal differences between the males and the females. We tried some things with estrogen and we saw no effects. But then we tried some things with testosterone, the male hormone, uh, or the hormone that is predominantly um, expressed in order to cause male differentiation. And what we found was that in regular male animals, when we stress them, we get no difference in their preference for that sucrose. We get no change in their anhedonia, no depressive-like behavior, right? That's just like I showed you before. But when we remove testosterone from the mice, when we don't let these males produce testosterone, then when we stress them, they have this reduction in sucrose preference. They have anhedonia. They have a depressive-like phenotype. And only when they have this, when we induce it, and it looks exactly like what I showed you with the females. This stress-induced decrease in sucrose preference models exactly the, this, this anhedonia in humans, and it fits exactly like what we saw in the female mice previously. So testosterone maybe is protecting the male mice from this stress-induced depressive-like phenotype. Okay, so if, if it's actually testosterone that drives this behavior, does this have anything to do with the circuit we've been talking about, this ventral hippocampal projection to the nucleus accumbens? Well, we did the same measurements in these male mice that I told you about before when we compared males and females. Our control male mice have very little activity in this circuit. See a few spikes here. But the males where we took away their testosterone, they have way more spikes, just like a female. So here are the, the males with testosterone, here are the males when we took away their testosterone. Their behavior is like the female, and the activity of the circuit is like the female, increased activity. Okay, so this was a really good clue. Maybe testosterone is driving down the activity of the circuit to protect the males from this depressive-like behavior. Okay, well, if, it, if it's actually doing that, shouldn't testosterone in a female protect the female? So we did exactly that experiment. We took females and we either gave them a control treatment with no testosterone, or we gave them testosterone. Here you can see those control females, they have high activity in that circuit. Just like I showed you at the beginning of the talk, the females have high activity, but when we gave them testosterone, the activity in the circuit went down, just like in the males. And you can see that here. Here are the regular females, high activity. Here are the females on testosterone, decreased activity. But what about their behavior? Well, here are our control females. And when we stress them, they have this anhedonia. They have reduced sucrose preference, just like I showed you before. They have a depression-like phenotype. But if we gave them testosterone, it prevented or reduced this reduction uh, in sucrose preference. It prevented that, that anhedonia. So putting these data together, it suggests that in the male, testosterone is driving down the activity of this circuit, and that's making the animal have a behavioral resilience to depressive-like phenotypes. But there's a lot more to do to prove that. Well, first off, we, we wondered uh, whether the testosterone was actually acting directly on this, on this circuit. As you, I'm sure, know, testosterone does lots of things in the body. It has effects on the bones, on the muscles, on the sex organs, of course, even on the skin and the bone marrow, and it has some effects in the brain. So it was possible that the testosterone was actually changing something in the bones or muscles that was then having some effect on the brain. 
uh, or it was changing something about the sex organs that operated then through some other hormone that affected our circuit in the brain, or even that it affected some other part of the brain that then changed the circuit. What we wanted to know was does testosterone directly affect this circuit or does it have its effects indirectly by doing some of these other things that then change the way the circuit works? Well, the way testosterone works in the body, and this is what testosterone looks like chemically, is it binds to a very specific receptor. This receptor is called the androgen receptor. And this receptor allows testosterone to have its effects on a cell. So cells that have this receptor can be directly affected by testosterone. Well, when we look in these green cells in the ventral hippocampus, the ones that project directly to the nucleus accumbens, and we stain for the androgen receptor in red, you can see these green cells have a bunch of red right inside them. These ventral hippocampal cells, the circuit that we care about, it makes the androgen receptor. It could be directly affected by testosterone. But the fact that it could be affected by testosterone doesn't mean that it is. So to test this directly, we did something really neat. The, the data I'm about to show you, we got last week. So my postdoctoral fellow, Andrew Eagle, that I'm gonna give some credit to at the end of this talk, he did these experiments and he showed them to me last week and I haven't shown them to anyone else. So we're the only two people in the world who know the answer to this question. And now you guys are about to be the next people in the world who know the answer to this question. Does testosterone directly affect the excitability of this particular brain circuit? And the answer was yes. We used some really cool genetic techniques to knock out this androgen receptor, to remove the androgen receptor in these ventral hippocampal cells that project to the nucleus accumbens. So this specific circuit, we removed the androgen receptor. Then we did that same recording of the activity like I've shown you a few times now. So here's our control mice that have the androgen receptor. These are male mice, so they have the low activity. And when we took the androgen receptor away, we knocked it out. That's why it says KO. We took away the androgen receptor, their activity went up. And you can see that graphed over here. So what this tells us is that testosterone acts directly on this brain circuit to drive down the activity of the circuit. But does that actually drive the behavior? So I've shown you a few graphs now, a few pieces of data that say when we make this manipulation, the circuit goes, activity goes down and the behavior, that anhedonia goes down. Or we make this manipulation and the circuit activity goes up and the behavior, the depression-like behavior goes up. But those are correlations. Those are the kinds of things that we can actually look at in a human. We can observe something here and observe it there and say they correlate with each other. But we can't say whether they cause each other in a human because we can't reach into a human's brain and change the activity of a circuit and then see what the human's behavior is like. That's not possible. And even if it were possible, it'd be unethical. But we can do exactly that in a mouse. So we used some really cool technology um, that I don't really have time to explain in detail, uh, but it's called uh, um, DREAD technology, designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. We didn't invent these, these DREADs, but we're the first people to use it in this exact way. What we, what we did was we expressed these designer receptors only in these ventral hippocampal neurons that project the nucleus accumbens. And what these receptors do is they can tune up or tune down the activity of the neuron depending on which ex receptor we express and the drug that we give to the animals, this designer drug called clozapine N oxide. So what this allows us to do, and this is the, it, it, don't worry if you didn't, under, uh, didn't understand or, or some of that part was confusing, what this allows us to do is whenever we want, we can make this circuit more active in this mouse or in this mouse over here, we can make that same circuit less active. So we can reach into the brain of the awake and behaving animal and tune up the activity of this circuit or tune it down. And this is a really huge advance for us and it allowed us to answer this question of whether that circuit activity actually drives the behavior. And, and you can see here on the left how we use this, this drug to change the activity of the circuit. So we took male mice, they have this low activity, we gave them the drug and the circuit activity goes up. And here on the right, you can see what happened to the behavior. Here are our control animals where we uh, stress them and you can see no change in their sucrose preference, no anhedonia, no depressive-like behavior, just as I showed you before. 
But here on the right, when we tune up the activity of the circuit, when we make the male animal circuit more active, just like a female animal, they have a reduced sucrose preference, they have an anhedonic response, and they have a, a susceptibility to this stress-induced anhedonia, this depressive-like uh, uh, behavior. So this tells us that in the males, if, we t if this brain circuit, that low activity of this brain circuit was actually preventing the males from having the depressive-like behavior. Of course, then we went to the females. We, they're, of course, more active, as I've shown you before, in this circuit. But when we, we use the drug to tune down the activity of this circuit, then we can induce the same behavior in the females where they, they are now resilient. So here's our control females. They have this reduction uh, in sucrose preference when we stress them. They have a depressive-like phenotype. But when we, we give them this treatment to make that single circuit less active, just like the males have, now they have uh, a resilience to this depressive-like phenotype, just like, like the males. Um, am I seeing... Uh, is the amount... Okay, uh, I'm, I'm seeing now a question. Um, is the amount of testosterone given to affect other responses in females? What are the potential side effects? What a terrific question. This is from Heather Peterson. So I'm gonna answer this in a minute, but uh, here, here's the, the, the basic answer is this. This is a treatment we could never do in humans. You, um, you could, can't just uh, take, uh, if, if we believe that the reason that women have this depression, uh, propensity for depression, is because the activity of their circuit is too high and testosterone will drive that activity down, well, why don't we just give them all testosterone and fix their depression? Well, your question gets to exactly this issue. If we gave women testosterone to fix their depression, of course, we'd have a million side effects. Testosterone does a bunch of other things in the brain and throughout the rest of the body, things that most women probably wouldn't like to have happen. And in fact, we don't even know what testosterone does to a lot of other parts of the brain. So we couldn't even really predict what the behavioral effects would be, let alone what the effects would be on the woman's physiology and ability to have children or normal menses or, or things like that. Um, so of course, the, the outcome of, of this project is not, hey, let's give all the depressed patients testosterone. But I'll tell you what we can learn from this that might push us in that direction. Um, and to actually get at your, um, your question about, uh, about dose, um, this, the, the levels of testosterone that the actual female mice experience in their bloodstream is about the same as the level of an adult male mouse in the exact same situation. So we give them extended release pellets that we implant under their skin that maintain a level of testosterone that's similar to a male mouse's level. So we dose this to be exactly like what a male mouse would experience, but that is not something we would do in a, in a human, obviously. Okay, great question. Uh, and what that gets us to is kind of the, the next point on, on, in my presentation, which is that these, these are really cool findings. We're really excited about this. And this tells us a lot about the physiology of the brain that might underlie things like depression. But this isn't something we can leverage to treat the disease, exactly as, as uh, Heather Peterson pointed out in, with her question. But what could we use to leverage? How, how could we use this information to treat the disease? Well, well, the way testosterone works on neurons, it does lots of different things. But one of the things it does is it changes which genes are expressed and which genes aren't. It has effects on the way the genetic material works in that neuron. And so what we wanted to know was what genes are being affected by this testosterone to change the function of this circuit and to change the behavior. And if we can find out if any of those genes are actually driving these effects, maybe those are druggable targets. Those are things we could actually design a medicine to target to help treat depression, invent a new anti, uh, antidepressant. So to do that, we used really cool technology. Again, I'm not gonna go into the details, uh, but this is called TRAP translating ribosome affinity purification. We worked with my friend Ian Mays at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York uh, to do this technique. Uh, and here, uh, it's, a, it's a technique that allows us to, in specifically in just those neurons in the ventral hippocampus that project only to nucleus accumbens, we can pull out of them their ribosomes and then sequence the RNA that's actively being translated in those neurons at a specific time. Now that sounds really complicated. The upshot is this. By sequencing that RNA and, and doing this technique, we can learn which genes are upregulated and which genes are downregulated 
only in this circuit in male versus female animals. And we did exactly that. And I'm going to spend about two hours explaining each of these genes to you now. Okay, I'm just kidding. Um, obviously, what we found was a ton of information. And we couldn't uh, uh, pull all of this apart uh, immediately. So the next few years in my lab will be spent trying to figure out which of these genes uh, is actually underlying this difference in the circuit and which of these, these genes then might be targetable with drugs. But what this tells us is that gene regulation in the circuit might be really important. Okay, so what I've shown you so far, and this is the majority of the talk is now over, and now I'm just gonna show you a little more neat stuff and relate this to addiction. But what I showed you in this big chunk of the talk here is that females are susceptible to this depression, female mice are susceptible to this depression-like behavior, this anhedonia-like behavior, and that they have an, pardon me, increased excitability of that specific circuit in the brain compared to males. And that this diff difference appears to be driven by testosterone in the males, and that gene expression may be an important way by which that testosterone changes the function of this circuit. So the question becomes, what drives this difference in gene expression, okay? And the last part of the talk, I'm gonna tell you about another protein that we're studying to try and pull this apart, and I'm gonna relate that to addiction. And that protein is called delta Fos B. For those of you that are into this sort of stuff, it's a transcription factor. Uh, it forms complexes with its partner protein, June D, okay? Uh, and that allows it to then bind to DNA and regulate the expression of genes. Now this protein delta Fos B has been studied in the context of depression and addiction in my lab and many others for decades. Uh, and it's, we know that it's a very important protein, but its function in this brain circuit that we've been talking about has never been studied before. But it is expressed there. Here's one of those green neurons that, that's in the ventral hippocampus and projects directly the nucleus accumbens. So this is our circuit. And it's got a bunch of this delta Fos B stained in red right there in the middle. Okay, so this delta Fos B is made in this circuit that we care about. And what we found uh, in a separate experiment is that if we express delta Fos B in these neurons, they become less excitable. So here's a control neuron, and here's a neuron where we put a lot of this delta Fos B stuff in it. And you can see its activity goes down. Now remember, that reduced activity was uh, really important for the behavior of the animal. Okay. Now, we related this to those depression behaviors and had a whole beautiful paper about this, and it was just accepted at Nature Communications last week, and in the coming months, you'll be able to read about this in detail in that journal if you're interested. So I'm not going to tell you that story. I'm going to just give you a little snippet of a story about how this also seems to relate to addiction, okay? So uh, we study cocaine addiction in my lab, and again, in mouse models. And what we find is that in this circuit, these ventral hippocampal cells, if we give the mouse repeated cocaine, so chronic cocaine, uh, and, and as you can probably imagine, uh, the mice don't snort cocaine lines or smoke crack cocaine. Of course, we have to inject the mouse with cocaine and, and that's how we, get it, uh, how we can uh, um, give the mouse cocaine over, over chronically over time. Uh, so if we give a mouse cocaine uh, over the course of a couple of weeks, it will build up this delta Fos B protein uh, in this ventral hippocampal area. And you can see that quantified here, okay? So, so this delta Fos B protein is made in the hippocampus in response to cocaine. And we have also now shown that cocaine uh, drives down the activity of that exact circuit we've been talking about. All right, so this ventral hippocampal cells that project a nucleus accumbens, our favorite circuit, it gets less excitable when you give a mouse cocaine, and it also gets less excitable if you give the mouse the delta Fos B, as I just showed you. So those two things look the same. So our hypothesis then was maybe cocaine causes delta Fos B to build up in this circuit, that changes the gene expression, and then makes the circuit less excitable, and that makes the mouse want more cocaine. That's our hypothesis. So let me show you how we tested that hypothesis or, and are continuing to test it. So first, we removed delta Fos B from the cells and then tried to determine whether that changed the effects of cocaine. Ooh, another question. Okay, um, there's a, a question that kind of relates back to the, the, um, uh, the talk we were having before. Since women naturally have some testosterone in their bodies, 
Could reduced testosterone levels be remedied in depressed patients and not require additional meds? Um, that's a great question. And I'll tell you that certainly is the case with males, with men. Um, men with low testosterone later in life are much more likely to have depression than men with uh, normal levels of testosterone. Uh, and testosterone supplementation therapy is actually used uh, and can improve depressive symptoms in males. I'm not aware of this being used in females yet. Um, and again, probably for the reasons I talked about before, we don't know what the side effects would be of giving high levels or even small levels of testosterone uh, to a female. Um, and I'm all, I, I should also really point out, and this is really important, I'm not a physician. So I don't do any of this stuff with, with people. All of my work is in the laboratory. I'm a, I'm a PhD, I'm, I'm a physiologist, but not a physician. So when I talk about um, the implications of these uh, studies, on human health, um, keep in mind that I'm talking about my understanding of the mechanics of this from a physiology standpoint, not, a, not based on underst a complete understanding of medicine, okay? Um, uh, Constance Spaulding also points out, this is, uh, Constance asked that question. She also points out this, it may actually help with sex drive too. That's definitely the case in men with low T, older men with low T. Um, again, it's effects on female sex drive uh, in humans. I don't really know. Um, and uh, I'm not sure what studies have shown uh, whether those effects are, are, are occur or not. Great questions though. Okay, let's finish this last little story about Delta FOSB. Um, uh, what, what, what I was telling you was that Delta Fos B reduces the activity of the circuit. Cocaine reduces the activity of the circuit. So maybe the way this works is that cocaine induces the Delta Fos B, makes the Delta Fos B, and that's what's making the circuit activity goes down, go down. So what we did was we, we took Delta Fos B away and then determined whether cocaine could still drive down the activity of the circuit. And what you can see here is that in our control mice, they have a certain level of activity. When we give control mice cocaine in red, that activity is decreased, just like I showed you on the last slide. But when we give the, the mice cocaine, when we have taken away Delta Fos B from the circuit, the activity doesn't go down anymore. So what this suggests is that Delta Fos B is controlling gene expression in this brain circuit, and that's driving the activity down in the brain circuit in response to cocaine. But does it control behavioral responses to cocaine? Well, these experiments I'm showing you here, these electrophysiology experiments, we do those by taking the brain out of the mouse, slicing it up and doing the experiments. Well, we can't then measure the behavior of the animal after we've taken the brain out. We have to figure out a way to knock out the gene from a specific circuit in the living, behaving animal. This is really not something that people have done before. And we collaborated with my good friend, Rachel Nevy at Harvard University to figure out the first way to use CRISPR technology to do a circuit specific gene knockout in the brain of an awake and behaving mouse. Okay. And this is really exciting. Uh, do I see some, some oh, oh. Uh, can you tease out if cocaine is directly influencing Delta Fos B or maybe indirectly by acting on a repressor of Fos B expression? Melinda Baker uh, is uh, doing her homework uh, and, and must have a background in this area, and she's absolutely right. So we published a paper uh, for, for Melinda, if others who might not be familiar with this area, um, th this, this isn't necessarily part of the story, but we published a paper just last year in the Journal of Neuroscience showing that in the hippocampus, what cocaine is actually doing is uh, increasing the methylation of uh, a specific site uh, in the tail of a, one of the histones uh, that's uh, in the, the nucleosomes around which the Fos B gene DNA is wrapped. So what it's actually doing, uh, cocaine causes the DNA to be wrapped more tightly around the histones so that RNA polymerase can't get in there and can't cause expression of the Fos B gene. Now, my friend Liz Heller uh, at the University of Pennsylvania at Penn, she showed this in the nucleus accumbens. My group has now shown it in the hippocampus as well. So we have an epigenetic mechanism uh, that actually involves the kind of repression that exactly like you're talking about, that we know exactly how cocaine is influencing the expression of the Fos B gene. And it is indeed through removing the repressive activity of histone methyltransferases right there. So that was a great question and we know the answer. I can actually give you an answer. We published it last year. Okay, great. So let's finish the story now. Um, so we used a, a really cool technology called CRISPR to do the first direct editing of a genome in the 
in the specific circuit in a living mouse. And again, I, I don't want to get into details on this, uh, but what we what we created with Rachel Nevy at Harvard was uh, a dual vector system that allowed expression of Cas9 and a guide RNA specifically and only in the circuit we care about, this one that projects from ventral hippocampus to nucleus accumbens, and it targeted the FOSB gene. Uh, and you can see here that it reduces expression of the FOSB gene specifically in this circuit. Now, for, for those of you who don't care about these issues, what this technology allowed us to do was reach into the brain of an awake, a living mouse and turn off a single gene only in a specific circuit. And we think we're the first people to ever do that. And we just published this technology in Nature Communications last week. Um, and that paper, again, will be out in the next couple of months and you can read about it there. Well, what, what we then did was uh, um, we did some behaviors that are related to that cocaine uh, consumption in mice. And I want to tell you about two behaviors and then we'll be done with all the science and I can take questions, okay? So the first behavior is called condition place preference. Here, uh, we, we take a mouse and we put them in a, a certain uh, um, a chamber and this chamber has gray walls and a textured floor. And then we give them cocaine there and they experience the cocaine and it feels really good and they run around and they're happy. And then we put them in a different chamber that has striped walls and a smooth floor, and we give them saline, which is a, a, uh, just an injection of nothing, to salt water, uh, and they hang out there for a while. And then the next day, we put them in this chamber, and we give them cocaine, and then we put them in this chamber, and we give them saline. And what that happens is they form an association between the chamber itself, the, the gray walls and the, the textured floor, with that feeling of cocaine, with those rewarding effects of cocaine. So then, we open up the doors between the chambers, we put the mouse in there and we let them decide where they wanna hang out. And as you can imagine, the mouse wants to hang out where it got the cocaine. And this is not a technique we invented. Many people use this all over the world. This is called cocaine conditioned place preference. And here's a normal mouse and it spends more time over here on the cocaine side and less time over here on the uh, saline paired side. So it likes the cocaine. And these are actually lots of mice that were our control mice, and they, they go hang out where they got the cocaine and not where they didn't get cocaine. Here are the mice where we specifically reached into the brain and turned off the delta Fos B only in that one circuit, the nucleus accumbens to the, the ventral hippocampus nucleus accumbens circuit. And you can see they spend the same amount of time in both chambers. They either they no longer find the cocaine rewarding at all, or they have uh, no, they don't associate the cocaine with the environment as much. Either one of those effects is really important for addiction. People, uh, in order to be addicted, need to find the cocaine rewarding and they need to know where to go get it. So if turning off this gene in this circuit prevents these behaviors, it could probably reduce addiction in a human. But, what, but the difference between humans and mice, well, there are a million, but one of the differences is these mice, we're actually giving them the cocaine. They don't get to choose whether they get the cocaine or not. So we did a different assay, and this is the last one I'll show you, last data slide here, where we allow the mouse to give itself cocaine. Now again, this is a gold standard technique that's used all over the world for the study of addiction. And what, how this works is that the mouse goes into a chamber, it has a jugular catheter that's attached to a syringe that's filled with cocaine solution. Uh, and then there are two levers in the chamber and these levers are connected to a computer which controls that syringe. So the mouse presses this lever and nothing happens. And then the mouse presses this lever and it gets a little injection of cocaine. And there are other things that are going on. It has to pay attention to certain lights or sounds that, that condition these responses. But in the end, what it learns is that it can give itself cocaine by performing an operant task, by performing an action. It can get cocaine when it wants cocaine. And over the course of weeks, the mouse learns how to do, and, and it does this for about an hour a day. Um, and and uh, it, can, it can learn this ta task over the course of weeks, and it will steadily give itself cocaine, uh, and, and, um, uh, and it will reach a level where it gets pleasure, but it doesn't overdose, okay? So then we can take the cocaine away, Make, put the mouse back in his home cage for a week or two, and then we put him back in this box, and we determine, does it still want cocaine? Is it gonna seek out that drug? Is it addicted? Does it go back and try to find the cocaine? Does it miss it? Did it love it? And what we find is that most mice will go back and they'll press that lever a whole bunch. 
They really want to get that cocaine again. It's a good model for a person who goes to rehab and then goes back on the street and seeks out cocaine again. Okay, it's for addiction. And this is exactly what we see in the mouse. But when we knock the Delta Fos B out in just that projection from ventral hippocampus nucleus accumbens, when we reach into that brain circuit and take away the Delta Fos B, the mice seek cocaine less in this assay. So what I've shown you is that we've developed a technology to reach into the mouse's brain and turn off a specific gene in a specific circuit. And that when we do that, it finds the cocaine less rewarding and it seeks it out less. That has enormous implications for addiction, okay? So this is what I just, just showed you. We showed you that that's the, the, the excitability of the circuit is really important, the Delta Fos B is driving that, and that that's essential, pardon me, for the rewarding effects of cocaine and the seeking of the drug. But again, you might be asking yourself, what are you gonna do? You're gonna reach into people's brains and turn off this gene in this circuit with these needles and surgeries? No, of course not. This is not a cure for addiction, but this might be something we can treat, something we can drug directly. I have a collaboration with my friend Gabby Rudenko at the University of Texas Medical Branch uh, in Galveston, and uh, also with uh, a, a gentleman there uh, um, named uh, Gian, who is uh, a medicinal chemist. Uh, and the three of us are working together, along with Eric Nessler uh, in New York, to screen compounds to find um, basically drugs that will target Delta Fos B directly. And we're trying to find, find compounds that we can then give to these mice and see if that reduces their cocaine reward and their cocaine seeking, and then move on to phase one, two, and three clinical trials and try to find a treatment for addiction. Now, this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow. We have decades of additional work to do on this. We've identified a few compounds already, and we're starting to test them in mice, but we have to refine them, find the exact right ones, make them cross the blood-brain barrier, make them actually work. And this will take a lot of work and a, a lot of time, but we think we're on track to find a drug to treat addiction. And that's our, one of our current main projects. Okay, the last thing I wanna do in just two minutes is tell you about all the other great stuff that's going on in my lab. There are many other projects happening in the lab. We have a number of projects where we're looking at the connections between the gut and the brain. A lot of these projects are being done in collaboration with my good friend, Adam Moser, right here at MSU in the College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, and with Eric Benbow, uh, who is also a professor here at MSU in entomology. We have a grant to study the role of, this, the, of, of microbiome in the gut uh, in aggression and violence. Okay, uh, and this is a grant um, that involves uh, both the School of Criminal Justice uh, and my lab uh, and, um, and involves a wonderful graduate student uh, named Christine uh, Kwiatkowski, who is a dual PhD student in neuroscience and criminal justice, an amazing kid. And we got this grant together uh, and um, in my lab, she is now studying using mouse models, uh, studying these connections, but then she has a collaboration with the Detroit Medical Examiner, getting uh, microbiome samples from humans across Detroit uh, um, from people who died uh, in violent manners versus control uh, people um, to start to understand a connection between the human microbiome and violent crime. So it's a really exciting project that involves criminal justice and neuroscience. Adam and I also work on these um, immune, immune cells called mast cells and how they affect gut-brain axis uh, in things like um, depression uh, and, um, and gut health. Uh, we also have a couple of grants to study Alzheimer's disease uh, with Jeannie Chin at Baylor, um, where we're studying the role of that same protein, Delta Fos B, uh, in the hippocampus in Alzheimer's disease. And then with my friend Gabby Rudenko that I mentioned earlier uh, at, in Galveston, we're doing a lot of structural biology to understand how oxidative stress regulates uh, the function of this Fos B gene, uh, the Delta Fos B protein, and how that regulates gene expression. So lots of cool projects going on in the lab that I don't have time to tell you about, uh, but they're all very exciting. Um, the last thing, two things I want to mention are, uh, I want to again thank uh, the College of Natural Sciences uh, and Dr. Duxbury uh, and Corey and Sarah for this opportunity. And I also want to thank uh, the college for putting us in the beautiful new building, uh, the Interdisciplinary Science and Technology Building right here on campus. We just moved in, uh, in in December. Here's a picture of the building from the outside. 
I'm on the fifth floor uh, up here. You can see how beautiful it is. And this is my lab space before we moved in. Now there's lots of equipment and people uh, in there. Um, but here's where we do all of our work and we couldn't be happier with our uh, state of the art facilities here. Uh, and then I want to finally credit the people who actually did all of these experiments. So I get to sit here and talk to you about them and think up these experiments and get excited about them, but somebody actually has to do this stuff with their hands. And this is the crew that does it. Much of the work I showed you today was performed by my wonderful longtime postdoc, Andrew Eagle, who just this year was promoted to uh, a, uh, um, a fixed term assistant professor here in the Department of Physiology. Um, I have a number of other postdocs and graduate students who are working on these projects. Also, a couple of terrific graduate students who graduated last year, Claire Manning and Liz Williams, did a lot of the work on depression that I showed you earlier. Liz is an MD, PhD, finishing her MD right now here at Michigan State. Claire Manning is now a postdoc at Stanford University, just lighting the world on fire out there. Uh, and then my collaborators I mentioned, Ian Mays at Mount Sinai and Rachel Nevy at Harvard, who helped do a lot of the work I showed you. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank all of our sources of funding. Um, this work is obviously very expensive. Um, we're funded by the National Institutes of Mental Health, Childhood Health and Disease, Drug Abuse, Neurological Disease and Stroke, uh, and we also have money uh, from the Aviel Foundation for those aggression studies. All of these grants are really important and are funding these projects, but they're not enough. We're putting out a lot, a lot more grants uh, as, a, as we speak and trying to get more money to continue to do these studies and to expand these studies. Uh, and it's all very exciting. Uh, I hope that you found it as exciting as I do and that you enjoyed the presentation. Um, if you wanna learn more, my website is here. Um, my Twitter handle is here if you're into the whole social media thing. Uh, and then uh, you can always contact me directly um, via email. I can't believe my email's uh, not written there. Um, but you can look me up on my website, contact me directly via email, uh, or go through Corey, Sarah, and the College of Natural Sciences to interact with me anytime. I'd be happy to hear any questions you might have.